in this video we want to talk about continuity and specifically about finding delta when using the epsilon delta criterion for proving that a function is continuous and we'll do that by looking at two concrete examples so I'm assuming that you have seen this criterion before and we're going to use it to prove that this function is continuous. Let's call it f and we'll say it's the function that sends f x to 3x plus 4, let's say. So we'll work through each of these quantifiers in order. So since this has to be the case for all x in our domain, I'll just start the proof like this. Actually, let's write out our claim first. Let's say f is continuous. That's what we're claiming. So the first thing we're going to want to do is to say, let x be some arbitrary real number, since this has to be true for all real numbers. And then we'll go to the next quantifier. This quantifier tells us that we should say, let epsilon be greater than zero, since this has to be true for all epsilon greater than zero. And then we get to the problem, to the interesting part, to the fun part. We have to prove that there's some delta greater than zero for which this following condition then holds. At this point, we have no idea what this delta should be. So let's just leave that blank. Let's say let delta be defined as being something or other. We'll come back to that. And then we can take a look at this condition and say that for all y with this condition, this holds that we want to show. So let's just say for all y in the real numbers such that the absolute value of y minus x is less than delta, right? That's just this here. The following holds. And what we're going to want to show, of course, is that this holds. So, first of all, we should start with this. So, f of y minus f of x, and the absolute value of it, we're going to want to show that that is less than epsilon. But before we do that, we're going to need to do some steps to get there. So, what could we do first? Let's first just sub in for our function. So we'll say that that's 3y plus 4 minus 3x plus 4. If we subtract that out, the 4s fall away, and we get 3y minus 3x. Now the only thing that we know here is that the absolute value of y minus x is less than delta. So let's see if we can get that to come into play here. We'll factor out the 3, and there we have it. That's what we wanted, since we know a little something about that. We can go ahead and take care of that. So we know that that must be less than 3 delta. And at this point, we have a delta without ever really having defined a delta. So before we go any further, we'll, we'll need to define what delta is. So what is it that we're actually wanting to achieve? Let's say that we were to have an equals epsilon here. Then that would, then we'd be finished, right? Because we already have this being less than this, right? If we could somehow get this equal sign to be right. So let's just do that. Let's say that that were the case. Let's say three delta were equal to epsilon. 
If I divided both sides by 3, I would just have delta being equal to epsilon over 3. Right? So, if I now just use that as a definition, in other words, I can go back up here and say epsilon over 3, then I could sub that in for a delta. That was epsilon over 3, right? We just sub that in. The 3's cancel, and I end up with epsilon. So, we're through. We have now proved that that function is continuous. Now, how did we do that? Well, we just took a shot in the dark. We just started transforming these functions, got as far as we could, went off to the side and figured out what delta would have to be in order for this to be the case and then just went back and defined delta that way right and that's basically the way that you can go about solving any of these such continuity problems in other words what we did was that we first took a look at these arbitrary x's and epsilons. So you could imagine that someone just wrote down the x that they wanted to test and they wrote down this epsilon that they wanted to test. And we were able to take a peek at these values before we defined our delta. So we got a good look at x and epsilon and then we saw what delta would have to be in order to have this be the case. So delta depends on epsilon and x, or better said, it can depend on epsilon and x, because in this case it really only depends on epsilon. We didn't have to use the x at all. Let's do an example now where it actually does have to depend on both of these. So I've taken the liberty of writing out this criterion again, this time we'll be dealing with the function that sends x to, let's say, x squared. And we want to prove that this is continuous. So what we can do now is just use this that we did before as a template. And just copy it word for word and only change this value of delta and obviously change these calculations here. So let's get to that. I've again taken the liberty of writing out this template. So we're claiming that f is continuous for this f. x is some real number. epsilon is greater than zero. delta is going to be defined as being equal to something. We don't know what yet. And we write out the rest of this template, and at this point, we're ready to sub in. So that would give us, in this case, a y squared minus x squared. Again, we somehow want to get this to come into play, this y minus x. So we could just factor that into y minus x times y plus x with the appropriate absolute value signs. Then we could use this little bit of information here. That has to be less than delta times y plus x, although we should be careful, I guess. What if y and x were both equal to zero, right? Then this here would be zero, and this would also be zero. So they could be equal, so I guess we should write a less than or equal to sign there, just to be careful. Okay, so what are we going to do now? We know something about y minus x, but we don't know anything about y plus x. So let's do something about that. Let's rewrite that. And this is a point where you need to have a good idea, because you can't really do anything with y plus x. So the good idea we're going to have here is just to rewrite that as y minus x plus 2x. Right? So we didn't change anything there. We just rewrote it. And then we can use the triangle inequality, which is always your friend if you're doing proofs like this.
comes up very often. Now, that gives us this. So again, we have this absolute value of y minus x, which is great to have because, again, we can just sub in our delta. So we're making progress. At this point, we have something similar, at least, to what we had the first time when we reached this point. Last time we had less than 3 delta, and this time we have less than delta times delta plus the absolute value of 2x. So it looks a little more complicated, but it's basically the same situation. So let's do the same thing we did last time. We went over to the side. First of all, we said what we'd love to have is that this is just equal to epsilon, right? So let's see what would have to be the case in order for that to be true. We'd have delta times delta plus the absolute value of 2x being equal to epsilon. Now if we divide both of both sides of this equation with this here, then we would have delta being equal to epsilon over this stuff here, right? Now this is unfortunately a problem because we can't define delta in terms of delta because we don't know what delta is yet. But let's just say now for the sake of argument that that, that had worked, then what we could do at this point would be to sub in for this delta, right, for this one here, we would just say epsilon divided by delta plus the absolute value of 2x, right, that's this here, and then we'd multi be multiplying it by delta plus the absolute value of 2x. These two things would cancel and we would end up with epsilon, right? So the question is, is this a fixable problem, this delta here? And the answer, it turns out, is yes, this is not difficult to fix. We just somehow need to get rid of this delta here. We have two deltas, right? This one is not a problem. This one is a problem. So let's use a nice trick that you might want to remember. Let's do this. Let's say that we want this to be the case. Let's say that up here is less than or equal to this. In other words, if it were the case that delta were less than or equal to 1, then we could do this transformation here. So I'm going to put a, an exclamation mark here because that's not quite yet clear that this is actually the case. But let's write a note to self here that we're going to want to have delta being less than or equal to 1. I mean, we could have picked another number. We could have picked the number 5 or 10 or 1 half or a million or whatever we wanted. But it's going to be less than some number. So let's just pick the number 1. And what we can do then is we can now go over to the side here do the same calculation that we did before. And this time it works out because there's no delta there. So what we can do now, and this time it will work, is just substitute in for this delta here. So we have epsilon over 1 plus the absolute value of 2x times 1 plus the absolute value of 2x. These cancel, and we end up with epsilon. So, it seems like we're through. But let us not forget, we still have to write in our value of delta. So it seems like what we want to have here is what we had below, which was epsilon divided by 1 plus the absolute value of 2x. Right? That's what we had here. But we can't forget our note to self. Right? We also said delta has to be less than or equal to 1. This delta has to be less than or equal to 1. So what we can do now is just combine these two ideas.
we'll just say that delta is equal to the minimum of 1 and epsilon divided by 1 plus the absolute value of 2x. Because then delta is less than or equal to 1 and delta is less than or equal to this here. So if that's the case, then we can definitely come back to this exclamation point that we wrote before and say that yes, we are allowed to do that since delta is less than or equal to 1. And here before we wrote an equal sign because we were subbing in. But according to our new definition, we can't necessarily write it an equal sign, but we do know that delta is less than or equal to this. right? So we could change this to a less than or equal to. And since we have already had a less than sign, altogether we have this being less than this, which is exactly what we wanted. In other words, we're done. So we see that this time, when someone was writing out which x they wanted to check and which epsilon they wanted to check, that we peaked at both of these when we made our definition. Right? We used the epsilon and we used the x. Now you might think, maybe you could look at this a long time and figure out a way of only using one of those, but it turns out in this case you do actually have to use both of these values. So at this point I should say one thing about the way that this delta is often shown. You might see this in a book or in some proof that you're reading that there will be the claim made that some function is continuous and they'll begin, okay, we'll say let x be a real number, let epsilon be greater than zero, and then they'll say let delta be equal to the minimum of 1 and epsilon divided by 1 plus the absolute value of 2x, and then they'll continue nonchalantly for all y in r such that etc, 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 the following holds, and you think, now wait a second, what is this? Where does this come from? This came out of left field. How am I supposed to, am I just supposed to believe this or what? What is this delta being equal to this crazy thing here? And maybe you've seen now how they come up with that. It's not something that they already know. They're doing the same thing that we just did here. They just start here, take a shot in the dark and start transforming this stuff until things start to make sense maybe because you see a, a term that, that you know something about then you go off to the side you do a couple of calculations maybe with a couple of exclamation part marks and arrows you maybe write a note to yourself you figure out what delta has to be and then you do this cheeky thing you select all this and you press delete and then you select all your notes to yourself and you press delete and it seems like wow you just came up with this on the fly and that's the danger when you're reading a proof in a book you're seeing only the finished product in other words they have already covered their tracks they've done all these calculations on the side but they've deleted them covered their tracks and they haven't give you, given you any idea of how they come up with that, that idea. But this is how you do it. You just start, take a shot in the dark, do your calculation, figure out what delta has to be and you're done. So now you know a little more about finding delta when proving the continuity of functions with the epsilon delta criterion.